Always good to be in church. You know what I, uh, you know what I didn't do today? I didn't do anything to stay saved. Did I tell you that? Yeah. I didn't do anything to stay saved. That is nice. I tell people sometimes I'm glad that I'm saved. Sometimes I'm glad that I'm still saved. And uh, you need to think about that. All right, I want you to turn. Thank you, brother. I want you to turn to uh, uh, um, Galatians chapter 4. Thank you very much. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> uh, you know, we believe in uh, typology in our Bible. And we also know, as you, as you look in the Bible in typology, you know that Abraham uh, is a type of God the Father. And so we're going to look at, uh, at Abraham and his life <clears throat> a little bit. Uh, and we'll talk to you tonight about three women uh, in the life of Abraham. Uh, if you know the story, Abraham uh, had three women that were very prominent in his life. Using him uh, as a type of God the Father, uh, we're going to look at three women in the life of Abraham. Uh, it says here in uh, Galatians chapter 4, I'll begin to read at verse 22. Uh, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Uh, but he who was of the bondmaid was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, and that's what this is. This, this is an allegory. Uh, for these uh, are, are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Did it say, did it say it's in Arabia? Okay, just checking. Your Bible says Mount Sinai is in Arabia, right? Okay, so the Sinai Peninsula is not part of Arabia, is it? Okay, just checking. For, a second. Uh, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, it is good to be saved. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you again, God, that we could be in church. Thank you we could be in church on a Tuesday night. Lord, Tuesday isn't a church night. It's not a night we're always in church, which means every single person, every single one of them that's in here tonight, there's something they're usually doing at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday night. And every one of these people tonight told you they would rather be in church than do what they usually do on a Tuesday night. So I hope you're blessed by their decision. I really do, and I hope they are blessed for their decision. So God, please speak to their hearts. Edify your people that they, being edified, would then go out and live to your glory in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Now we're looking at, uh, it says there's two of them here. It says that um, verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid uh, and the other by a free woman. We know the bondmaid is Agar. What do we know about, or we call her Hagar? Uh, Hagar, uh, number, verse 22, it says she is, she, the one was of a bondmaid. She was in bondage when she had Abraham's child, correct? This lady was never free. Guys, Hagar is a type of the world, is it not? Guys, the world's never free. The world is never free. You know, I can't get over how many young people in our, uh, in our churches, they, they kinda, it's kind of like they're biding time. There's somebody here, I guarantee you, there's some kid here, you're 16, you're 17, maybe you're 18, uh, and though you're facing this way, your heart is staring at that door right now, and you go, man, I'm going to get out there because there's something out there I am missing. Yeah, yeah there is something you're missing. Uh, let's see, your time in rehab, your tattoo, your piercing, uh, your divorce. Uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot you're missing. But this lady was never free. I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing about the world that is free. Nothing. Nobody is free in that world. They are bound by something. And so Hagar is in bondage uh, when this boy is born. Look what it says in verse 23. But he was of the, who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. All right, our first birth is of the world, and we are what? We are after the flesh. Everything about us is after the flesh. You know what I see more in our churches? Guys, I'm in a different church every week, and I am in a good church every week. I really am. You know, we do two years east, two years west, uh, and I get people, they'll say, uh, boy, I'll bet you get in a lot of arguments with pastors about the King James Bible. And I go, never, never, no. I am not a missionary. I don't mean that bad about missionaries, but missionaries are seeking support. They call a preacher uh, who they think is a King James guy, and then they get there and find out this guy thinks Easter doesn't belong there, or, uh, you know, uh, the archaic words need to be taken out. Guys call me for meetings. If they call me, they already believe the book. So I'm in a different church over a four-year period almost every week, and they're all like this one. They're all good. But I am telling you that our people are getting more possessed by the flesh than ever before. We are more smitten with that world than we have ever been before. 
But here is the world, and the world is always after the flesh. Everything about that world draws on the flesh, does it not? Whether it is something that, uh, that addicts you to it, whether it is something that it, it is the glory. Uh, if it doesn't always have to be the base, you know, we always think of the, uh, the bad side of town and all the drugs and the sex, and all this garbage that goes on the bad side of town. Guys, it may not be that. It may be the applause. Uh, it may be the trophy. But there's always something about the flesh. Isn't that true? Uh, I, I tell people this. You guys heard when, uh, when our guy got in the White House and he had a big bailout. Uh, and uh, those corporate executives that took the bailout and, and they wrote themselves bonus checks. And you know who condemned them? The world. I think that was the, I, I have no understanding about that whatsoever. Why did the world condemn them? When it was the world. You know, who, you know who wrote those checks to themselves? Men who from this big were wearing the it's all about me t-shirt. Right? I mean, haven't they been told it's all about you? You know what they sing in public education, public schools? They sing, they have a song called, I am the most important person I know. You know, you tell these little kids this big, you know, you're a champion. No, he's not. He's a dumb kid. Right. I mean, look, man, he's got his right shoe on his left foot, and this is a champion? I imagine he can make corners fast, but other than that, he's not a champion. And here's what those guys were told from this big. They were told, it is all about you. You are a champion. You're the most important person you know. Now they're in, a, they're in an executive job, and they look at this, and they say, look at this. we got enough money to do one of two things. We can take care of business, or we can take care of us. And they went back to their closet and they looked at the shirt and it still says, it's all about me. And they knew how to make that check. Why is, I'm not saying they did right. I am saying they did what they were trained to from this big. They were given to the flesh. And not all flesh is, it's not all the carnal, it's not all the fleshy desires. But guys, I am telling you, there are people here, I, there have to be Christians here. And you are more excited about what the flesh gets excited about. Guys, I, I, you know, I'm from Ohio, that's where football got its start. I like football. I couldn't tell you what the positions are. I couldn't tell you, you know, what a tight end is. I, I think the guys didn't want to spend money. I don't know what they are. I don't care. Now, I don't care who is on what team. I don't know the coach. We're hoping, I'm, I'm from Ohio, I'm still hoping Cleveland gets a pro team someday, okay? Uh, but, you know, we used to watch sports to enjoy it, but now, man, it's, it's your life. You've got to have all the paraphernalia. You've got to have the sweaty jersey from your favorite player. What is that about? It's about the flesh. And we are caught up with the same thing. So, so Hagar is in bondage and after the flesh. Look at verse 24. These things are an allegory, uh, for these are the two covenants, the one of Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage. Hagar was in bondage when Ishmael was born, correct? But Ishmael gendereth toward bondage. Again, Everything in the world is made to addict you. You're going to get addicted. Do you ever notice that everything bad is now a disease? I mean, if you were a drunk, used to be a drunk, there are no more drunks. Isn't it nice? We've eliminated drunks. We now have alcoholics. Uh, if you were a drunk, if you're overweight, if you have a disease, uh, if, you are, if you are a thief, you're not a thief, you're a kleptomaniac. You have a disease. Everybody has a disease. I heard some bozo, and I, they, they ought to string him up, uh, he said that molesting children is a disease. Can I give you where this ends? I'll give you where this ends. When the world is done defining every sin on the, on the, on the planet as a disease, there will only be one bad thing, truly bad thing that you can do. You know what it is? Accept Jesus Christ. That won't be a disease. They look, look at what they are embracing. Look at what they are, they are uh, putting themselves on. And guys... Look at what we, we get addicted to. Uh, you got to see your favorite program. You got to have every, uh, you got to have the DVD and every single uh, episode of it. You know what I tell folks? You know what, if you got a favorite program, first, if you've got a favorite program, why? Why? Oh, that's right. You haven't seen a couple murders or rapes tonight, and you know, you got to have that before you go to bed. But if you have a favorite program, why don't you try this? Miss about three episodes in a row. Now, I probably just went, somebody just went, oh, I couldn't do that. Yeah, you could, because you'd see somebody not die who isn't dead anyway. Right? Everything about this world gendereth to bondage. And, and everything, it's made to addict you in some way. And, and guys, that's, that is Hagar. 
look, uh, stay here, because we're going to be coming back to, to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 4, but I want you to go with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. That's right after Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 16, uh, it says this, verse 6. But Abr Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thine hands. See, this lady's never been free. Hagar's never been free. Uh, do, to her as it, do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when, when Sarai uh, dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in a wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And, she, and he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, this, don't take this personal. Tell your daughter, don't take this personal. But, but guys, <clears throat> the world is always loyal to itself. I don't know about you. When I was lost, we had a, uh, we had a phrase, and we'd say, uh, sworn to fun, loyal to none. You know what we were sworn to? We were sworn to have a good time. We were loyal to no one. And the world is loyal to itself. This world will bail on anybody. Isn't it amazing? Uh, they have a guy over there some years ago that um, they, remember in, uh, in uh, Somalia, uh, they shot down that, that uh, helicopter. I'm not talking about Mogadishu, but they, they shot down that helicopter uh, and they killed those, uh, those American troops. And a couple of months, I think it was three months later, the guy that was in charge of that is being chauffeured around in an Air Force C-130. Our country is not loyal to anybody. We, are, we will do what is politically expedient. The world is always loyal to itself. And here's the problem, guys. You look at what they're doing and you look at what they're saying and you think, boy, if I join up, uh, I, you were talking about safety tonight. I'm going to be safe because I'm going to get like under their umbrella. They'll write you off in a heartbeat. The, the world is only loyal to itself. Beware of who you trust. Guys, you really don't have much you can trust outside of Christianity. You tell me everything that's bad about Christianity. You tell me about the, hypocrisy, the hypocrisies of Christianity. You know, I always think about this. You ever talk to anybody and you invite them to come to church and they go, uh, I'll go to church, man. There's just too many hypocrites in the church. Now, ain't a hypocrite somebody self-righteous? Did you ever notice that the person who said they won't come to church because there's too many hypocrites is usually self-righteous when they say that? Yeah. Isn't it funny that the guy that won't come to church because a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites won't come because are those people over there at church, they don't think they're better than anybody else. So why aren't you going? Because I'm better than them. Yeah. Right? right? This world is loyal only to itself. Hagar was loyal to herself. She took off. You know why? Because she didn't like her circumstances. You know what this world teaches you? This world teaches you. Now, look, there was a time when there was character. There was a time when you were told to stick to it. There was a time when you, you, you took your stand. Uh, you took the beating and you did your job. That is gone. And now I, I talk to young guys, you know, and everybody says, well, I can't find a job. They've had three in three months. They go out and get a job. And then they find another job that gives them like, what, three cents an hour more uh, or more, more email time or what, some, and they bail on the guy. You know, a loyal man is a guy that passes up a job that offers him more because he wants to stay where he's at because he wants to be loyal to who he's working for. That's gone. That's gone. So the world is loyal to herself. Now, I want you to keep this. No, you don't have to keep this. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. Look at verse 9. And Sarah saw the, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, uh, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. Never free. Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. The world will never reign. That world is never going to reign. You know what the world wants? The world wants the same thing God wants. They want a kingdom on this earth. You know the difference? They don't want Jesus Christ sitting on the throne. 
Look, what is the goal of the United Nations? The goal of the United Nations is to have a one world kingdom without Jesus Christ sitting on the... You ever stop and think that what they're working toward is the same thing we're working toward? The difference is we believe you ought to have Jesus Christ on the throne and get down on your face and worship him. Is that not true? Brother, they ain't bound down to nobody. But they all want to rule. Everything about this world, they want to rule. You know what they're going to do? They're not going to rule. They can put the political pressure on another nation. Uh, you know, they, uh, what our country just did to uh, the Redskins. The, the patent office just broke the law by telling the Redskins, if you don't change your name from the Washington Redskins, we're going to not protect you under the patent. We now have a nation. What would you think if, you, if somebody's beating on you and a cop walked up and said, you said, stop this guy. And he said, oh, no, we don't, the law isn't for you. We don't protect you. You say, that's never happened. Yeah, it was called Germany, 1935, yeah, yeah. when they were beating on Jews and nobody, nobody arrested them. Yeah. And so now the Washington Redskins, I heard today, are going to change their name. They're dropping Washington because it's such an embarrassment to them. <laughs> <clears throat> Just so much crime. <laughs> but the world will never rule. You know what this world hates? This world. You, you tell them you're not going to win. You're not going to rule. They had a League of Nations. This fell on its face. They got a United Nations, which is held together with, with not even duct tape, guys. Just, just scotch tape. I mean, this thing is barely held together. Uh, and they're trying to present a un united front. Uh, they're going to they're gonna set up a kingdom. You know how this is going to end, don't you? Right. They're going to have seven years to give it a shot and it is going to fall flat on its face, and then the Lord is going to come back. They want a kingdom without the king. Isn't that true? They're never going to reign. You tell the world, all of your plans are going to go to naught. Everything you're doing, everything you're working toward, all your world peace, because some of them, some of them are sincere. Some of them don't want people to starve to death. Some, some of them don't really want people to be oppressed. Uh, some of them don't want nations invading other nations or cutting off people's heads. Kind of a novel thing. But guys, doesn't matter, they will, the world will never rule. I am telling you that as the world sits tonight, they dwell on the fact that they are not going to rule. It does not sit well with them. And that is why we are a burr under their saddle. We are a sore spot to them. If you ever had a sore spot, you ever have a sore spot? No matter what you, you get a sore on the end of your elbow, and no matter what you do, boy, you know, you hit. We are a sore spot to this world because because they all get together and they tell what they're going to do to rule. And we come up and say, uh, oh, yeah, that's going, to, that's going to work for about seven years. And then it's going to fall flat in its face. And then our God's going to come in there and he is going to wipe you guys out. And then he's going to do what you've been trying to do all this time. He's going to have a one world government. But he's going to run it. And he's going to run it just like you were going to run it with an, with an iron bar. And so, guys, the world will never rule. Let me tell you i give you a thought about uh, how great civilizations fall. Great civilizations are great for one reason. Sorry, ladies. They're men. They are, they are great for their men. Every great civilization has had a great army. It's had a great military. And you look in this Bible. You look at some of the great... How about, uh, how about Babylon? Was that not a world power at one time? That's Iraq, right? Now, here's what happens. You have, you have men in a military situation, and they go out and conquer, and that nation becomes a great nation. Then you know what happens? The character of the men rot. And when the character of the men rot, then you know what they get? First off, they all get more fierce. If you ever, if you ever talk to guys that, were, uh, that are in special forces, they don't have the attitude of a professional wrestler. They don't come and go, <laughs> that's, that's not. I had... Uh, I had lunch with this guy. Uh, he was a, a SEAL some years ago in Norfolk. Blonde hair, blue-eyed, California kid, just perfect million-dollar smile. He's only about my size. He didn't have, you know, he didn't have tattoos all over him. He didn't have, he didn't have uh, you know, little air valves on his arms to inflate him or anything. I mean, <laughs> this guy wouldn't stand out in the crowd. This is the kind of guy that the, that the professor was like, get out of here, boy. Excuse me, sir, but I was in line ahead of you. Don't make me do this. Well, it's okay. It's just step back in. And all of a sudden, the guy is laying on his back crying. I said, see, I didn't want to have to do that to you. <laughs> I mean, this guy looked like he would probably be just smiling as he killed you. <laughs> but you talk to guys in special forces, and they don't, it is not all, I'll tell you what we're going to do. But as the character of the men fall, 
the fierceness of the men rises. Did you know, you know what the Bible says in end times? Men will be fierce. And today, everybody in our country has the, has the attitude of a pro wrestler. Do they not? Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, man. No, you treat me with some respect. Yeah. Isn't that where it's at? Yeah. Guys, why do they burn people in Africa? Because some, well, they didn't show me respect. Look, all this time, all around the world where the heathen rage uh, and they kill each other, it's always, well, he didn't show me any respect. Ask Brother Dennis Wells about the problem with respect in New Guinea. And how if one guy was uh, done wrong, how the whole village would get upset. Well, they treat him with some respect. So you have Babylon. And as the character of the men fall, they get more fierce. Then they lose the battles. And you know what their conquests all get? Here's the two outstanding things of a fallen nation on, in the men. They all talk like they can whip the world. And their only conquests are sexual. So you had a bunch of guys, you know, in, uh, in the first Iraq war, and only in this country. Now, back then, the biggest, biggest uh, weapon we had was a 15,000-pound daisy cutter, they called it. Uh, and, uh, and only our Air Force would fly over somebody, drop little, they dropped little leaflets on these guys. You know what they said? <laughs> it said... They said, tomorrow, you're going to be attacked by the, by the largest bomb in the world. You ought to surrender today. Are you know what these guys all did? <laughs> hey, if you want to conquer an Arab country, all you need is a TV camera and a gun. When they're coming at you, put up the TV camera. What do they do when they see a TV camera? <laughs> click, click, click. Put down the TV camera. <laughs> that was easy. And so they're all going, oh, no, 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 no. and the next day, I mean, do you know what our, bomb, our bombers are? Our bombers are a B-1, a B-2, and a B-52. And none of them showed up. Instead, here comes a lumbering C-130 cargo plane. You know why it was a C-130? Because this bomb is too big to put in a B-1 and a B-2 and a B-52. And this ramp comes down on the back. And on rollers, this little thing, they just nose the plane up. Three little parachutes come out. You say, why the three parachutes? Because the C-130 needs to lumber out of the neighborhood quick. <laughs> and these guys are looking, they're looking at this. What's that going to do? And it gets about 1,000 feet off the air, and whoo! And a half an hour later, another C-130 drops. Some more leaflets. And it says, you were just attacked by the largest weapon, the largest bomb in the world. And tomorrow we're going to do it again. And they all went... <laughs> See, they beat their chest. They were a great people. Listen, that, that, you know who Iraq was? That was Babylon. But look at the... Listen... The one, un, the one thing that does not outsta- stand out about Iraqi men is men. They are not manly. Look at the nations. Look at Persia, Iran, same thing. Is it not true? Look at Greece, same thing. Look at Rome. Rome, Rome conquered that world. Rome built the aqueducts, built the highways. I mean, some of those aqueducts are still in use today. The Roman 18-inch short sword conquered the world. Would you like to compare the Roman army to the Italian army? You saw that news, that classified ad in the newspaper, for sale, Italian, World War II Italian army rifle, never fired, only dropped once. (laughs) You know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you, if that is the format that it goes, do you know what? But now look at all of those countries. All of those countries, the men act fierce, and their conquests are on women. And we are getting into the place in this country when the men, where the men are all acting fierce. Look, if you're impressed with a guy that's got biceps and tattoos and talks about what he's going to do to everybody, you better take a step back. And if you're impressed with somebody that, that his only conquest is, is the, the women that he's had, you aren't talking to a man. Do you understand that? 
And if this nation goes down, when we lose our military battles, we are going to be no different than those nations. You mark that down. It's not going to be pleasant to be here. Go with me back to um, Genesis chapter 16. I, I did want you to go back there. Look what it says. What is uh, the children of the bondwoman going to be like? Verse 12, and he shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Guys, just a real literal interpretation of that. If you can't see the, the, the Arabs in that, you aren't reading your Bible. They are wild men. Their hand is against everybody. I mean everybody. They are killing Chinese people. The Muslims are killing Chinese people in China. They are killing Americans in this country. They are killing Englishmen in England. They are killing Frenchmen in France. They are killing Sweden, Swedes in Sweden. They are killing Arabs in, in Saudi Arabia. They are killing people all around the world. They are the walking plague, are they not? And where do they dwell? They all dwell right there. They all do. I wonder if that means we never have to worry about being conquered by them. I, I'm not going to write that up, but they all dwell right there. Hey guys, <clears throat> that is the world. One other thing about Hagar. She never was married. She had that kid. Say what you want. You know what we've got? Now, look, some of you girls, will you please listen here? There are some traditions that are good. And you know what's a good tradition? It's called a white wedding gown. Do you know what a white wedding gown represents? That represents a young lady who has kept herself pure for one man, the guy that asked her to marry him, marry him and, and she is pure. You know what we have now? We have girls that that they think, look, you don't have to cook anymore. You don't have to put on makeup anymore. You don't have to do your hair anymore. You don't have to watch your weight anymore. As long as you can perform like some, somebody off, of a, uh, off the south side of town or something, as long as you're okay in a bedroom, everything's going to be okay. Brother, sister, you bought the wrong, the wrong propaganda. And you want to go out and live like that, and then you want to walk down the aisle in a white wedding gown. I was talking to a pastor not long ago. He says, man, I, he says, I interview him. And he said, if they are not pure, I tell them, you're not wearing a white gown. And he said, I get people, they leave my church. And he says, you know why I do it? He said, well, you think, oh, he's punishing those women. No, he's not. Because there's a girl that's staying pure. And he said, she deserves the white gown. Because that's, hey, you know what every girl wants? She wants to be married. That lady was never married. Hagar never, he, she was, the kid was never legitimate. What are the duties of the children of Hagar? They should acknowledge their father. Abraham is their father. They do that, do they not? They, not, they acknowledge Abraham as their father. They should worship God. Now, not Allah, not any other false god. They should worship the God of the Bible. They don't like the God of the Bible. But they should worship the God of the Bible. They should obey his laws. And you ready for this? Don't try to steal Isaac's inheritance. Because we were told that Isaac is going to get the inheritance, correct? It's not going to be the children of the, of the, of the bond woman. It's going to be the children of the, of the free woman. All right, I want you to go back with me to uh, Galatians chapter 4. Let's look at the second lady. <coughs> Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above all, is free, which is the mother of us all. Uh, For it is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not, Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. Uh, for the desolate hath uh, many more children than she which hath an husband. Uh, now we, brethren, uh, as Isaac was, are children of, the, of promise. All right, then what do we know about Sarah, number one? She was chosen, wasn't she? She was chosen, was she not? You know, I, um, I told you I'm in, I'm in uh, churches like this every week. You know what, what, what amazes me? It, it saddens me. It really does. I get in church, and it'd be a young, bunch of young girls get up and sing. I'll sing about the Lord. They'll get up, and I'm looking at these girls, and, and, and I mean, they're dressed nice. They look nice. They don't look like they're for sale. These are girls who just want to do something to please their creator, please their savior. They want to live for the Lord. And I look at those girls singing, and I say, what is wrong with this? All right, can somebody tell me there's anything wrong with it? Nothing wrong with it. So why does my, why does my country hate that? Why does my president hate that? Why does my Congress hate that? Why does Hollywood hate that? Why does everything in this world hate that? Isn't that right? You know what Sarah was? Sarah was chosen. You know what every young girl wants to be? She wants to be chosen. 
She wants some guy. Now, I'm sorry. She doesn't want to be bartered for like a cow, dad. Okay? She doesn't want anybody to pay a bride price for her like all the other heathen do. She doesn't want to hear from her father that he made a deal with another guy's father and that it is the will of God that they get married. She wants somebody to choose her. She wants to know this guy wants to be with me. You know, uh, this August, Kathy and I will celebrate 42 years of being married. I proposed to her down by the creek, under the tree, on my knees. I mean, it was like uh, it was like supposed to be, you know. It was just, we, we liked it. And you know what I told her when I asked her to marry me? I said, Kathy, I don't want to be married. I didn't want to be married, but I want to be married to you. I, I love this girl so much. I didn't want to live the rest of my life without her. I, you, know what, you know what marriage is? It is the ultimate sacrifice. Because here is a guy, here is a young lady, either way, and they could have a life in some way. And you know what you say? When, here's what this guy says. This guy, in essence, he didn't say these words, but he said, you know, I could do fine by myself. I am going to sacrifice everything I could do fine. And I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you. And she says, you know, I could tell you, go take a hike, and I do fine too, pal. But I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to sacrifice everything I could do without you to be together. And I chose that lady. I chose her. You say, well, wasn't her father involved? Yes. I went and asked him. I asked if I could marry her. He said yes. But I want you to know, if he just said no, I'd have been Christian about it. I would have invited him to the wedding. But this girl was chosen. You know what else? She was married. Yeah. Isn't it funny? The world, there must really be something about marriage yeah. that eats at this world because they hate it from both sides. Yeah. Now, now stop and think about this. This world says to the young man and young woman, marriage isn't important. Just go live together right? Don't they say marriage is not important? Remember how, haven't they told them that for about 20 years now, 30 years? Don't bother getting married. Just go live together, right? Because marriage doesn't matter. But if it's two men or two women, suddenly marriage becomes something that's just really important. You say, why? Because both of those positions destroy marriage. Because this whole relationship with God is about marriage. Is it not? Sarah was legitimate. She was married. Look at verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Isaac was the promised seed. You know what everybody wants to hear? Everybody wants to hear, we wanted you. We wanted you. We have three boys. We wanted them all. We did. We wanted them all. We wanted our first one. We wanted our second one. We love him. We wanted our third one. I was an unwanted child. I told you. I was born two years after my parents' last kid. Um, uh, I, had, I, had this been in 1970, I'd have ended up someplace in a garbage can and abortion clinic. Don't you dare say it should have been 1970. But um, everybody, you know what nobody, and my parents never said this, by the way. They, they never looked at me and said, we never wanted you. They were never belligerent to me. They were never unkind to me, okay? But nobody wants to think that you were an accident. Nobody wants to think that you kind of uh, wedged your way into a really nice situation that had done fine without you. You know what everybody wants? They want, they want you, you know, I tell my boys to this day, I love, I love Nathan. I love my son, John. I love my son, Luke. I'll call him. I'll text him. Uh, I'll, I'll send him an email. I'll say, I'm so glad you're my son. I'm so glad I'm your dad because I love them. I want them to know they, they were always wanted. Doesn't it feel good to be wanted? Maybe I'm talking to somebody. Could. Look, you can't have a crowd this big and tell me that you were all wanted. There's somebody here that your dad didn't want you, your mom didn't want you, and you oh, just don't feel good about yourself. That's okay, you don't have to feel good about yourself. But I'm telling you that that kid was wanted. Don't you think that that really, really ate at Ishmael? Here was Isaac. He was the child of promise. The problem. And give me a thought about, about Sarah. Sarah was an amazing woman. What would you ladies do if you're on the wrong side of town? I don't know where the wrong side of Boise is. But if you're on the wrong side of Boise with your husband and you get surrounded by some of the locals and you're scared and they go, uh, hey, bud, who's she? And your husband goes, uh, <clears throat> I'm a sister. Uh, sis, you want to you ride in her car? They got a nice car. <laughs> and let them take you. That's what he did. That's what Abraham did. 
I've always said this, guys. I've always wanted to hear the first conversation that Sarah and Abraham had when they got back together. <laughs> Which I really don't think was much of a conversation. I think Sarah did most of the talking, somewhere around 90 decibels. I think Abraham's addition or part of this uh, conversation was, yes, you're right. It, yes, I am. No, 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 no never again. God, I'm sorry. I bet you that's all he said. And then, you know what happened again? That was, that was Genesis 12 that happened again in Genesis 20. You know what I just think? What would have happened if when the guys rode up it, with Abimelech, and here's, here's Abraham all scared. And of course, you know what happened. They said, who's she? And he goes, my sister. Wouldn't have been so if they, if they, they went... Uh, is that your wife? And before he could speak up, she'd go, oh, no, he's just my brother. Can I ride on your camel? <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. I'm your husband. <laughs> Maybe she'd have used some reverse psychology. I don't know. But I know this. Isaac is the child of promise. And Sarah was always true to Abraham, was, he, was she not? But Sarah is the type of Israel. And you know what happened down the road with Israel? One of the most unfavorite chapters I have in the Bible, I don't like reading this chapter, is Ezekiel chapter 23. And it is about Ahola and Ahola Bama. It is about Israel and Judah. I don't like what it talks about. I don't like the descriptions. I don't like the words. I don't like that chapter. You know why? Because I, I, I just don't like it. But what it's describing, it is describing the end of Israel. You know what the Bible says about Israel at the end? They were worse than the heathen. And that's from the one God chose. I, I tell you guys, I don't believe that Israel was God's chosen people. I believe Israel still is God's chosen people. He has not written them off. He is not done with them. He is going to use them again, okay? In fact, if you want safety, probably the best place to live would be right downtown Jerusalem because that, that's probably the safest place you could be. What should the children of Sarah do? They should worship God. Now, some of them do. And is this not amazing that some of the greatest enemies of Israel are Jews? Some of the greatest enemies of Israel are, are, are people of Israel. Some of, the, some of the people who have done the most damage to the Jews have been Jews. I can, I, I'm stunned. There's a few things that stun me. And the most stunning thing to me is a secular Jew. That a Jew could say, I am a Jew, and I don't believe in God. Right. You got to be a Jew by believing in God. He made you. But they found a way to do that. Their job is to worship God. Their job is to obey his laws, just like Ishmael. And their job is to stay out of the world. You look at Israel. You know where Israel, through in this book, and in modern history, you know where, where Israel always goes wrong? Every time they try to get along with that world. How many of you, remember what it was, now been five years, six years, I don't know how many years, when um, you know, Israel had taken the Gaza Strip back in 67, uh, and, uh, and they got pressured in, and, and Ariel Sharon, of all people, man, I mean the lion of, uh, uh, of, of Israel, gave Gaza back to the, to the Philistines, uh, to the Palestinians. And everybody said, all it's going to become is a launching point for missiles into Israel. You know what it is? It is a launching point. There's no peace. There's just a launching point for missiles into Israel. So more Jews are suffering. More Jews are dying. Why? Because Israel's trying to get along with the world. Israel should, should just do this with the world and just say, look, stay out. I hate to say this, guys, because if you look in the past, we have been one of the best friends Israel's ever had. But they're going to come to the point where they're going to have to tell us, hey, stay out. Just stay out because we can't trust you anymore. So they should worship God, obey his laws, and stay out of the world. Now I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter 25 and look at this third lady. Genesis chapter 25. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. Stop and think about something for a second. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? Oh, come on, somebody knows the answer, don't you? He was 100. That's a 100-year-old guy. Uh, I haven't checked on the age of Ishmael about here, but if I'm not mistaken... Ishmael is just about to get a bride, which puts him somewhere around 40 years old. 
So now you're talking about a guy that is really old and he is looking for a wife. And I doubt she's 140. She's probably a, a fresh 75. <laughs> well, whatever. She was young enough to have a kid and 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 a kid. And she bare him, verse 2, Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. The guy is well over 100 and he's got a whole nother family. Do you know what Keturah means? Keturah means incense. What is incense a type of? It's a type of prayer. How'd you get saved? You say, well, I trusted Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. That's right, but did not most of us get through there on a, on a prayer? Keturah is us. We are the Gentile. Keturah was the Gentile. Keturah is the Gentile bride. What is the, are the outstanding things about us? Because this is what really matters, because this is about us. This is the most important thing. God made the Jews reject Jesus just so we could get in, right? I mean, it was all about us, right? I mean, that's how we all think. I love this because to see how important we are. First off, look at verse uh, 5. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. It just told you the names and the grandchildren. The children and the grandchildren of Keturah. And when it gets done saying that, it says, by the way, Isaac got it all. But didn't you already know that? Didn't we read in Genesis 21 verse 10 that Isaac was going to get it all? Yeah, that was before Keturah. That was before her kids. That didn't change God's plan at all, correct? Guys, we haven't changed God's plan. That's what I'm telling you. I am not here. I have got enough verses in this Bible that I can read and I can get blessed. Can you go to the Bible and find a verse get blessed by it? Then why do I have to hip check Israel out of the picture and try to steal a, a, a promise that was given to them? I'm happy for Israel they've got promises that, that I can't claim. i got enough I am happy with what I got. I don't have to go, well, how come they get that one and I don't? Shut up! We're doing real good. So you know what the children of Keturah need to know? Sarah's kids still keep the inheritance. This world is still going to be Israel's. It is not going to be ours. I don't mean that by Gentile. I mean Christianity. It is not going to be ours. It is going to be Israel's. Well, what do we get? Well, take a look at verse 6. But under the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts. Ah, well, come on, guys. You're Gentile. You like gifts, don't you? Man, we build our churches on gifts. We love gifts. We make, up holiday, we make up holidays just to get gifts, do we not? I had a friend of mine that he, was, he had a conviction against Christmas. Good man of conviction. Preached against Christmas trees, bale bushes, and, and, and all. But at least he did believe in that in that good old American tradition of exchanging gifts on New Year's Day. And I, come on, guys. I mean, that is as crooked as it is. When he dies, they're going to screw him into the ground. He's so crooked. But we like gifts, do we not? You say, well, what kind of gifts? I'm a gift. Didn't he say that, that, that an evangelist is a gift? I'm a gift. <laughs> you don't really look excited <clears throat> but I'm not going to wear a bow on my head either wait a second let me see gifts gifts how about this one the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ Lord. is that a good gift Amen. you know if you're saved here tonight you know how I know you got saved every one of you got a gift Amen. isn't that true guys you know what we get we get gifts but watch this, because Abraham's got some sense. But of the sons of the concubine, verse 6, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son. He said, okay, guys, you're not getting the farm. You're not getting the land. It's all going to be Isaac's. Get out of Dodge. So he gave him gifts and told him to hit the road. But look where they go. This is a thought for you. And sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward into the east country. So Isaac's children by, by Keturah all headed east, correct? Correct? Did you ever wonder this? Did you ever wonder why at the birth of Jesus Christ, men came from where? Why is men came from the east? 
These guys went east. Did you ever, and I can't prove this, but wouldn't it be something if somebody told those guys, look, you just guys, you go east, but keep your eyes on the western sky because one of these days there's going to be something go on to one of your kin, and you're going to want to show up for it. Wouldn't it be something if we could go back, maybe we'll find out someday, that the wise men, and there, I certainly believe there were more than three, wouldn't it be something if we, if we, when we get up there and we find out that those wise men that came from the east were the distant relatives of Keturah's children, maybe they came from the east because they always, they went out east and they were enjoying their gifts, but they always said, remember, remember Pop said, keep watching, watch out there for the west, watch, there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a star or something we're going to watch for. So, these guys, they, they don't get the inheritance, they did get gifts, they sent them away. So, you know what the job of the Gentiles are? To get sent away. No, I don't mean sent away to a prison. I don't mean sent away like, would you guys get out of here? You know what I think of? I think of a little town. Little town, I shouldn't say that, a large city called Antioch. Antioch was the center of the New Testament church. You know what Antioch was? Antioch is where the New Testament, the chapter in the, in the history of the church called Foreign Missions got started in Antioch. It got started. didn't get started in Jerusalem because that's a Gentile city. It got start, or, 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 or a Jewish city. It got started in a Gentile city. And you know what the Gentiles did? They hit the bushes. It is our job, guys, to go around the world. It is our job to go around the world. And, and you know, I, was, um, I do this. I, I, I do this here. I do it every church I go to if I can. Uh, I like to go down all of the missions, uh, and, and I pray for all the missionaries. I pray for each one by name. Your church, thank you. If you're a, pro, uh, a, a prospective missionary here, could you do two things really good on your, on your uh, letterhead? Make your name and your country easy to see. Because I'm in churches, and I'm going... Pray for the Smiths. And I finally look down, and at the bottom it says uh, field address, and I find out they're in Togo. You know, you can put Togo in big letters. Just think of pizza, to go, okay? <laughs> and your church, you have the name and the country so prominent. I'm telling you, it made it so much easier. I'm going down through this yesterday. I was going down through to pray for this group. I went down there and prayed for that group. But guys, you know what our job is? We're the Gentiles. We're the children of Keturah. We're the, gen the children of the Gentile bride. Our job is to go around the world. Our job isn't try to get the promise because the promise isn't for us. It's still for Israel. Our job is to tell people about all the story of this book and about Jesus Christ. Now, here's the kick, and I love to tell Gentiles this because we are so important. And I do, think, I, I do think I've got to be wrong on this by two verses. What is a Gentile number? Well, two of you knew that. Okay, for the rest of you, 10 is a Gentile number, okay? Do you know how many, how many verses there are in the Bible that address the children of Keturah? A grand total of eight. That is how important. Look at the size of this book. And if we are the children of Keturah, we take uh, verse, uh, chapter 25, verses 1 through 6. That's about Keturah and her children. Uh, and 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. Those eight verses are all about us. Boy, are we ever important. Now, I think there ought to be two more somewhere because it just seems like there ought to be a number 10. But even if there isn't, guys, don't you just feel important to know that, man, the Bible tells about eight verses about me. Oh, wow, you're really something, pal. We couldn't even get a chapter but I'll take it because we still got in, didn't we? Uh, hey, guys, let me ask you. There's only eight verses about you if you're a child of Keturah, right? You still going to heaven? So are you going to gripe? You still get the gift? Still get to come to church? Do we still get to get in on not just what's going on now, but all of the things that are in the future that we read about in this book? Guys, are we in? Don't get your ego too big, you Gentiles, because we're just not that important. It's Isaac that is important. So what is our duty? Our duty is to worship God. Our duty, take a look at Titus chapter 2. And I'm going to use a four-letter word that has five letters. I say four-letter because you, you avoid it like it's a four-letter word.
Uh, look at verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing uh, of the great God and our, sa- of our, sa- our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us uh, from all iniquity and purify unto himself uh, a peculiar people. See, there is a place for heaven. <laughs> Zealous of good works. We don't like that word works. Right? We don't like that word. Can you get to heaven by works? No, we, you can't. And when somebody says, I'm good enough, they're saying, my works are going to do it. And we reject that. But the problem is that once we get saved, we still reject good works. The Ten Commandments can't get you to heaven, but they wouldn't be bad to try to, after you get saved, we'd probably do, be doing a little bit better if we really took the Ten Commandments a little more serious after we got saved. What does it say in chapter 3? Chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, uh, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Oh, we heard this this morning about a faithful saying. Uh, that they which have uh, believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable, profitable unto you. Look at verse 14. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Hey, guys, here's our job. Worship God. I said, worship God. And you don't worship God the way you want to do it. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm going to come and I'm going to worship God with this song. Oh, I've heard some of those people, I'm, I think they must have been mad at God. Yeah. With whatever they did, it was kind of like somebody shot a cow and didn't achieve their, their goal. They got him half dead. We should be worshiping this God. We should have good works. You know what our other duty is? Hit the bushes. Our job is world missions. I want to show you one thing, and I'll let you go. Uh, I want to show you, did you know I I always say this, uh, God got a new car? God got a new car in Matthew chapter 16. A car is a vehicle, is it not? And if you want to get someplace, you get in your vehicle and you travel, correct? All right. And look what it says in verse 18. And I say, unto you, uh, uh, I say also unto thee, talking to Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, first off, you are, not, you are not charging the gates of hell. Don't worry about that. I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to get in. All right? I hear, I'll charge hell with a squirt gun. Have at it, pal. I'm just going to get close enough to, to grill the burgers. I don't want to get any closer than that. But do you know who, when God wanted to carry a message in the Old Testament, you know who he used? What nation? Israel. Yeah. If God wanted to speak to Israel, he went to Israel and got a Jew and said, tell the Jews this. But if God wanted to tell the Babylonians something, he didn't go to Babylon and get a Babylonian and tell tell the Babylonians this. He went to Israel and got a Jew and said, you go to Babylon and tell them this. Anytime God wanted a message delivered, he got a Jew. Correct? Correct. Because they were his vehicle. In fact, uh, look at, uh, look at verse 20, uh, chapter 23. They had world missions. Look at verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for he can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. What? Compass sea and land? Oh, do we not have some people in here that have been on the mission field and they got there by going across land and sea to get one convert? And we even have a, an example of the success of that mission program in Acts chapter 8, verse 37. You got a guy from Ethiopia in Jerusalem worshiping. What is an Ethiopian doing worshiping in Jerusalem? Unless somebody from Jerusalem went down to Ethiopia as a mission field and got one convert. But the Jews ain't doing much evangelistically now, are they? Because they rejected their Messiah. And they don't have a message for the world, do they? So you know what he said? I need a new car. I need a new vehicle. So now when God says, I want to tell the world something, he doesn't go get a Jew. He comes to a church like this one. And he comes and he taps on the shoulder of a young man. He, he tells this young lady, oh man, it busts my heart when I meet a young lady and she says, I'm just waiting to marry a, a, a man who's going to be a missionary. I, there, it is so rare. Because now I want him to be a corporate executive and have five cars. But they say, when God wants to carry that mission, that, that message now, he comes into the children of Keturah, does he not? And it's the children of Keturah who go halfway around the world and make a proselyte. 
make a convert. Isn't that right? So you know what our job is? With our big eight verses, worship God, have good works, and be about world missions. Don't give up on missions. That's our job, guys. The children of Keturah were sent out of the country. They were told to hit the road. If I could tell you in, in, in one phrase what you're, the will of God is for your life, hit the road. Now don't not show up tomorrow night and say we you know, did what Gip told us. But, but our job is to knock on the doors. Our job is to evangelize the world. You are to knock on the doors around your neighborhood. You are to knock on the doors around your, your city, around your state. Now, you can't knock on doors all the way around this world. So you got two halls filled with pictures that you sent, on, sent people halfway around the world, some of them, to do what? Knock on the doors. You know who they are? They're children of Keturah. They're children of the Gentile bride. And they are carrying out their destiny. Not their obligation, their destiny. Our destiny is to hit the road, do something for God. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, could I speak to the young people for just a second? I don't know what you want. But more and more, our young people are excited about being rich and being corporate executives and being great athletes. I'm going to ask you not to play until I get done praying. Um, in our churches, in our churches, our young people are getting more excited about the things of the world. And you look in the catalogs and you look at what everybody else has. You want all the toys and all the bells, all the whistles. You want the beautiful house. You want the boat. You want the RV. That wasn't what you were bought for. That was not what you were put here for. You're children of the Gentile bride. Your job is to go around the world. I wonder if I'm talking to a young man. Maybe God's been dealing with your heart. Maybe it's time tonight to say, God, I'm going to give up on all my dreams and all the things that I want so bad that it hurts. And I surrender to go wherever you want me to go and tell people about Jesus Christ. I don't want the inheritance I want to do what the children of Keturah are supposed to do. I want to go around the world. I want to go someplace in this world. And I want somebody to end up in heaven because I went there. I wonder if I'm talking to a young lady. Oh, young lady, I know you want a husband. You want a house. You have no idea how, how tough it was for my wife 28 years ago to give up a house. She'd like to have a house today. We can't have our grandchildren over our house because we don't have a house. Maybe you need to say, Lord, you know all my dreams. But God, if you'll just give me the right guy, if you'll have somebody choose me, I'm willing to go any place in this world because I'm a child of Keturah. My job is to hit the road, beat the bushes, and tell people about you. I wonder if young people here tonight would consider sacrificing your dreams, sacrificing your life, sacrificing what you want, what excites you, what you desire. I wonder if you could just say, hey, maybe you won't get called. But you would say, God, if that's what you want, I'm willing. I am willing. I will put all my dreams in a box that's cardboard and I'll put the match to it and watch them go up. I will do, I will go where you want to go. I'm a child of Keturah. I want to fulfill my destiny. Father, we are the children of Keturah tonight. We are the Gentile bride. Our job is to obey you. Our job is to worship you. Our job is to have good works in our lives. Maybe I'm talking to some people. They're not called to preach, but they don't have good works in their lives. Maybe somebody needs to change some things, secret things. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to illuminate anybody's sin, God. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, expose anybody. But maybe somebody says, God, I don't have good works. I don't pay my bills. I don't keep my word. I'm not a good neighbor. I'm not a good Christian. Maybe somebody needs to start doing some good works tonight. And maybe some of these young people need to say, God, I am willing to die for you. Not physically, not to have to be physically, but all my dreams, I'm willing for them to go. I just want to fulfill my destiny for thee. God, I pray these people make the right decision for thee. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed as the instruments play, if you need to come, why don't you come? Will you come? Young people, don't live for yourself. Do not live for yourself. All across this country, we have married couples. They're living in slavery. You know why? 
because they're both working. You say, well, they have to do that to, 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 to make it. No, they have to do that to have all the toys. They could make it on Pop's check, but they couldn't have all the toys. And you go after all those toys, and those toys don't satisfy anyway. But you answered that call. And you can change some part of this world. Dennis Wells went to New Guinea for 23, 24 years, him and his wife. They altered the destiny of hundreds of people. And you can't do that with your boat and your jet ski. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 363, number 363. something tonight? Amen. 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 Appreciate both of those messages. And that business of missions, you know, it's one thing to have a missions program. It's one thing to be sending money. It's one thing, but it's another to, to kindle that spirit, Amen. that spirit in a church, that mission spirit. And that's what I saw stirred up tonight with all these young people here at the altar. And you know what's just as important as them coming and surrendering is we've got to surrender them as well. Amen? Because we can say, oh, no, don't, don't send my kid. You know, here am I, Lord. Send Brother Jones's kid. But uh, if he wants to send ours, we've got to be willing to let go and let the Lord do that. Appreciate that. That was good for us tonight. It's good for me, good for our church. God bless you. Good night. You are dismissed.